In an incredible scientific publication, Dr. Samuel Stroop and his colleagues at Northwestern have reversed paralysis in mice with traumatic spinal cord injury. But how did they do it? They used complicated large biomolecular scaffolds with enhanced supramolecular motion. That's quite a mouthful, and I'll explain the whole thing. This video is a little bit technical, but definitely worth it because remember what the Buddha said, there is no wealth like knowledge and no poverty like ignorance. So this study uses a mouse model of severe spinal cord injury using a contusion or blunt force to the thoracic spinal cord resulting in hind limb paralysis in the mice. In other words, the back limbs are paralyzed and then the behavior and motor function of the mice is analyzed over time as they recover. Now it's well known that there are certain protein signals that occur during the development and growth of the nervous system that involve the extracellular matrix or the matrix of proteins outside of the cell. And so they give specific molecular signals to the neurons and supportive astrocytes and to the growing axons. Now the problem is if you dump these signals, these protein signals, say, into saline, very few of them interact with the receptors in a meaningful way, and so it has no real biological activity. So what these scientists did is they created a supramolecular polymer, and I'll show pictures of this in a moment, in order to create a strand-like scaffold, which forms a gel in the body, and that allows for greater binding to the target receptors. And they use two key molecular signals, which I'll explain in a moment. Now, unfortunately, the scaffold can be somewhat stiff and there isn't a lot of motion or a lot of interaction with receptors, so they actually induced mutations into part of the protein sequence outside of the active signal, and this allowed for greater molecular motion, and they call these dancing molecules, and that seemed to be the key to the success of this experiment. Now, recovery from spinal cord injury is highly variable, and you could accuse the authors of cherry-picking the video I showed you earlier of the two mice, but this was in fact a randomized controlled blinded trial. They gave half the mice saline solution with the biomolecular scaffold and half got saline alone injected into the thecal sac, into the thoracic spinal cord at the level of the injury 24 hours after the severe contusion. Why 24 hours? Well, in real life, if you have a spinal cord injury, it's not like you can get treated within minutes. It takes time to get to the hospital, to get the CAT scanner to the MRI, for the surgeon and their team to come in and do the procedure. So the authors thought 24 hours was a little bit more realistic. Now we know the human nervous system has some potential for regeneration, but it doesn't necessarily work that well in real life. Why is that? Part of it may be abnormal malignant inflammation leading to scarring. And these astrocytes or supportive cells of the nervous system can form scar tissue known as an astrocytic scar, which may block chemical signaling and block axon sprouting, preventing recovery from injury. And one of the ways this treatment may work is by preventing this inflammation and astrocyte scarring. So what are the two molecular signals? Well, one of them is laminin, which is a protein that's known to be important in the extracellular matrix affecting neural differentiation in the developing human and in other organisms. And instead of using the real laminin, they use the sequence of five amino acids, which has the same effects of laminin laminin, and it's attached to this large supramolecular scaffold that's designed to make it interact more with receptors. So IKVAV is just a sequence of five amino acids. It stands for isoleucine, lysine, valine, alanine, and valine, and it has the effect of binding the transmembrane receptor beta-1 integrin, which in turn signals the cell itself to differentiate. So for instance, neural stem cells, which are naturally present in the spinal cord after injury, can differentiate into neurons. It also signals axons, the nerve fibers, to extend and sprout and hopefully rejoin the other side of the injury. The other signal is fibroblast growth factor 2, FGF2, and again, it's not the real FGF2, it's an artificial sequence of amino acids attached to a supramolecular scaffold and has this long sequence of amino acids, Y is tyrosine, I believe, and this in turn activates the receptor, fibroblast growth factor receptor 1, and this promotes cell proliferation and survival. Also, it has an effect of blocking microglia, the inflammatory cells within the central nervous system, and hopefully stopping formation of this astro or glial cell scar, which impairs 
recovery from injury in many cases. So this is a diagram of the scaffold. You have the lipid tail. Then you have the sequence of amino acid that affects the motion control. And they introduce mutations to influence this and make the molecules dance and bind more to receptors. And they had different versions of it, including PA2 and PA1. And then the business end of the molecule, the signals such as lamin or FGF2, which actually binds the receptors and causes the changes in the nervous system we want to induce after injury. So again, you can see the construction of the supramolecular scaffold, the hydrophobic tail. You can see the mobile protein that allows the dancing of the molecules, and it forms these beta pleated sheets, which allow for motion. There's an intermediate charge group, and then the business end of the molecule, the bioactive epitope. And you can sort of what it looks like in this diagram in three dimensions, where the active component is at the end on the outside of the fiber. And this is what the fibers look like in the electron microscope. And you can see IKV. Those are the five amino acids that bind the laminin receptors. Here again, you can see the individual strands in the electron microscope, and this is a three-dimensional reconstruction, and IKVAV or FGF2 on the outside of that fibril. And then you can sort of see a diagram of the collagen extracellular matrix and IKVAV binding the laminin receptor, which in turn induces changes within the cells that I described previously. And Strep is really standing on the shoulders of giants. It's well known that that laminin and FGF2 are very important based on other research in neural growth, development, and recovery from injury. For example, this is a diagram of extracellular matrix protein laminin in the development of the neural crest in the developing organism, and you can see it causes migration and layering of neurons. This is a study in mice showing a normal control mouse with functional laminin protein that has a well-organized marginal zone of the neocortex, but without laminin, the neocortex cortex is completely disorganized. This is a mutant mouse that has no functional laminin protein, and the mouse has a devastating neurological disability. It's also known that fibroblast glose factor induces the suppression of inflammation based on microglia. This is one such pathway. You can see it binds the receptor and induces expression of the protein CD200, which then suppresses the neuroinflammation of microglia. Again, they are involved in the formation of the astrocytic scar, which can prevent axon sprouting. So enough about theory, let's look at the results of the experiment itself. You're looking at sections of the thoracic spinal cord, and this is the spinal cord in cross-section, and it's stained with different stains to highlight different tissues. So GFAP is gliofibrillary acidic protein, which marks astrocytes, or the supportive cells of the nervous system. Red is the blood vessels, and the blue stain is the nuclei, which is in the neurons themselves. So on top, you see the uninjured mouse, the mouse without a thoracic spinal cord injury, and this is just normal. At the bottom, you see the sham mouse, the mouse that just got saline, no treatment whatsoever, and you can see the spinal cord is shrunken and atrophied. You can see there are very few blood vessels, and the distribution of astrocytes is very abnormal. The nuclei, the neurons, are relatively preserved. In the two treatment groups, there's much greater volume of the spinal cord and much better blood flow and a more normal distribution of the astrocytes marked in green. Interestingly, you can see that the group that got this specific combination, the second one from the top, seemed to do a little bit better. This was IKVAV, again, that is the laminin uh, modeling stimulus of the cell with PA2. So PA2 is the specific mutation inducing certain molecular motion. But FGF2 seemed to work better with PA1. So interestingly, mixing and matching the specific mutation causing a certain motion of the molecules seemed to work better with a different active signal. I have no idea why. And this is the exact same thing, except these are high magnification images of the ventral horn, which is the front of the spinal cord where the neurons, the spinal motor neurons, normally reside. And again, this is the uninjured mouse on top. This is the sham, the group that got only saline, no treatment. And these are the two treatments in the middle. So if you look at the sham group, you can see there are a lot of nuclei there stained in blue representing the neurons, but virtually no blood vessels and no astrocytes, the supportive cells of the nervous system. But the middle two groups, the treatment groups, look almost normal, particularly the group second from the top, as I mentioned 
mentioned before. And lastly, I want to show you the motor outcomes. This is basically an objective way of looking at the video I showed you at the beginning of the two mice. So they use the Bezo mouse scale, the BMS for locomotion after spinal cord injury. And basically it's a zero to 10 scale with higher being better, more motion. So at the beginning, the mice average a score of nine, which is normal. After the spinal cord injury, they all go down to zero, completely paraplegic, but then they start to improve. And you can see the sham group in black, the control group, they do improve, but not very much. They end up with an average score around two. Two of the treatment groups, the blue and green superimposed on top of each other, end up recovering moderately to an average score a little over four. But the best treatment group the red, which again is the IKVAV with PA2, FGF2 with PA1, again the weird mix and match, they seem to do the best with an average score of a little greater than six. And if we look at the basal mouse scale score, you can see it's based on plantar stepping, coordination, paw position, trunk function, tail movement. You can imagine even a one or two point difference is a very clinically significant difference. So the researchers didn't just cherry pick those two videos, this was an enormous difference. Difference, and if applicable to humans, it could make a major difference in spinal cord recovery. So this is extremely promising, and Strupp's lab wants to move forward with human trials. And they're looking to get approval for the FDA to do a trial in humans, and they would work with neurosurgeons in a trauma center. And if you had a spinal cord injury, while you were having your surgery, you would have the option to get into the trial and potentially receive an intrathecal injection of this biomolecular scaffold, which could potentially help you recover from your injury. And then we would follow people over time to see if they recover better from expected. Generally speaking, there's an open label trial where no one is in the placebo group first, just to ensure safety, and then later placebo controlled trials. But I think it's very, very exciting. Of course, mice are different from humans. There's no guarantee this treatment will work, but there is a lot of potential for successful translation into humans because we know that laminin and FGF2 are highly conserved proteins involved in growth, differentiation, and repair in the nervous system in humans and many other organisms. So this definitely could work. Of course, the first step is acute spinal cord injury. Maybe later on, this could benefit people with chronic spinal cord injuries or other diseases of the spinal cord, such as multiple sclerosis. Though there are no guarantees, I certainly think the future is optimistic. I want to thank Strupp's lab for sending me this article personally. I was not able to obtain it on my own, and I emailed them, and they did, in fact, send me the PDF. Also, I apologize for any errors in this video. This is obviously outside of my area of expertise. Please post any comments, corrections, or suggestions for future videos below.